Hi everyone, welcome back to another video in the Web Security Academy series. In the previous video, we covered lab number 9 in the SQL injection module. So we got some hands-on experience by exploiting a union-based SQL injection in order to list the database content on a Postgres SQL database. In today's video, we'll be using a union-based SQL injection attack to list the database content on Oracle databases. If you do not have an account on the Web Security Academy, you can get one by visiting the URL portswigger.net slash websecurity and clicking on the sign up button. I already have an account and I am logged in. So to access the exercise, I'm going to click on Academy, go down, select the learning path, select SQL injection, go down one more time, select examining the database. And the challenge that we'll be working with today is titled SQL Injection Attack Listing the Database Contents on Oracle. So let's click that. All right, let's get started. This lab contains a SQL injection vulnerability in the product category filter. The results from the query are returned in the application's response, so you can use a union attack to retrieve data from other tables. The application has a login function, and the database contains a table that holds usernames and passwords. You need to determine the name of this table and the columns it contains, then retrieve the contents of the table to obtain the username and password of all users. To solve the lab, log in as the administrator user. All right, so over here we've got a couple of end goals. The first is that we need to determine which table contains the usernames and passwords. Then we need to determine the column names in that table. And then we use that information in order to output the content of the table, which would be the usernames and passwords of the users of the application, including the administrator user. And then we need to log in as the administrator user. All right, so the nice thing about this exercise is that it doesn't assume that we have any prior knowledge of the name of the table or, for example, the names of the columns in the table like we did in previous labs. Instead, in this lab, we're going to have to figure that out all on our own, just like we would have to in a realistic scenario. OK, so let's access the lab. and create an analysis section over here. All right, so it looks like the same shopping application that we've been dealing with in the past couple of exercises. You can filter on category. So if I filter on gifts over here, it'll only display the items that are related to this category. So the items that are related to gifts. And we saw over here the category filter is in the URL. To confirm that this is vulnerable to SQL injection, we just add a single quote, which is a character in SQL. And this results in a syntax error in the backend database, which results in an internal server error in the application, which confirms that this is vulnerable to SQL injection. Now, whatever gets entered in the category field is displayed on the page, and that means we could use a union-based SQL injection to display content from other tables, like a table that contains the usernames and passwords of the users of the application. All right, so since we're working with union-based SQL injection, there's a couple of steps that we need to perform. The first one is to determine the number of columns that are being used by the vulnerable query. And we said the way to do that is using the order by clause and iteratively ordering by the number of columns that are being used by the vulnerable query. So we start with one. If we get a 200 response, that means the vulnerable query is using at least one column. And then we'll increase it to two and to three and so on until we get an internal server error, meaning that we're trying to order by a column that does not exist. So to do that, I'm going to use burp because it's much easier when it comes to encoding the 
input, click start. Okay, let's move that over here for a little bit. Go to proxy, set foxy proxy extension to intercept or to send requests to burp. All right, and now when I load this, it should get intercepted in burp. And it does. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to send this to repeater because I'm going to be sending multiple requests and I'm going to turn this off. All right, so we could see in the application there has to be at least two columns, one for the name of the item and then another one for the description of the item. But again, there could be uh, more columns that are not displayed on the page, which is why we have to enter this payload in order to figure out the number of columns. So we could start off with one, although I'm pretty sure that there is at least two. But let's do this iteratively. So control U to URL encode it, hit send. And we get a 200 response code. That means there's at least one column and it's ordered by it. Let's do two. And again, control U to URL encode it. Hit send. Okay, we get a 200 response code. That means we have at least two columns. Let's try three. Hit send and we get a 500 internal server error. So let's write that down. And what that means is we're trying to order by a column that does not exist. So the number of columns that the vulnerable query is using is 3 minus 1, which is equal to 2. All right, now that we know the number of columns, we need to find out if these columns accept type text. And the reason we do that is because the usernames and passwords that we want to display from the user's table are of type text. And so we need to be able to output them in a column that accepts that type. And so to do that, so let's just say find data type of columns. Okay, so to do that, we use the union select null statement. So I've got two null values over here because I know there's two columns based on step number one. Now, if we go back to the page, we could see the first column contains alphabets and the second column contains alphabets. So I know with about 100% accuracy that this, that both columns accept type text. So instead of doing this iteratively column by column, I'm just going to put type text in both of them. So A and A and see if it gives me a 200 response. And again, control U to URL encode it, hit send, and I get an internal server error. Now that's weird because you could see over here this accepts type text and this accepts type text. However, remember that in the title of the description, it says that we're dealing with Oracle. And we learned from a previous lab that in Oracle, you need to have the from clause. And so we're going to use from the dual table, which is a dummy table that can be used. Okay, so let's try that and do control U. And I did that incorrectly. And I'm doing shift to you. Here we go. Control U. Hit send. And we get a 200 OK. And we should see our A characters somewhere in the text. And we see them right over here. All right, so make a note saying first that this is an Oracle database. And both columns accept type text. All right, so the third step usually would be to determine what database we're working with, but just because it gave me an error on this query over here, I knew that it was an Oracle database and it works when it comes to dual, so I no longer have to display the version of the database to see what database we're dealing with. So step number three in this case would be to output the list of tables in the database. 
And in order to do that, we're going to look at the hints section, which has the SQL injection cheat sheet. And I wanted to open that in a new page. And if we go down, you could see the section database contents tells you how to output the list of tables in the Oracle database. And it tells you for other databases. But again, we know that we're working with Oracle. So we're just going to look at this section over here. So you use all tables in order to output all the table names in the database. And we have to make that work with our union based SQL injection. So union select, and we need two column names over here. So I don't know the column names of this table over here. So I'm going to Google it and say Oracle. Okay, so you could see over here, one of the columns is table name, the other column is owner and so on. I'm only interested in getting the names of the table. So I'm just going to say table name, and then the next column is going to be null. We have to have two columns again, because over here we determined that the number of columns is two. And then we comment out the rest of the query, copy that, go back to burp. Control U to URL encode it. Hit send. And we get a 200 response, which is good. Now, if we go down, we should see the list of tables. So you've got access, that's a table name, alert, and so on. We're looking for something that has the word users in it. So that looks like a built-in table. So that's not what I'm looking for. Saying goes with this one. Here we go. So this looks like it's a custom table for the application. So I'm going to assume this is the table we're looking for and put it over here. Now that we know the table name, we need to know the column names that contain the usernames and passwords of the users of the application. So the next step is to output the column names of the users table. And to do that, we'll look at the hints section again. And this is the way you output the column names from the table. So let's copy that. Again, we have to make it fit with our union based SQL injection. So we'll add union select and I need two columns over here. So let's say column and null. We'll figure out what the column name is in a bit and table name over here. So the table that we found and then comment out the rest of the query. All right. So to figure out the column names that are available in this table, again, I'm going to Google it. So we've got owner, table name, column name. Here we go. So that's what I'm interested in. All right. So this should output the column names of the users table. So let's copy that. Go to burp. Control U to URL encode it. and hit send. Again, 200 response, that's a good sign. And if we go down, it should display the column names of the columns in that table. So you could see there's this one over here. There's this one over here. And I think that's it. So it only actually has two columns. So the username one, let's copy that. and the password column. All right, so now that we know the name of the table 
and then the names of the columns that contain usernames and passwords, we could output the usernames and passwords of the users of the application. So the next step is to output the list of usernames and passwords. Okay, and to do that, we start off our union based SQL injection, and then we say select the username over here and the password column from the users table, which is this one over here. And then comment out the rest of the query. Let's copy that, put it in burp. Control U to URL encode it. Hit send. And again, 200 response, that's a good sign. That means the request worked. And if we go down, you see that it's outputting the usernames and then the passwords. You've got the username for administrator, Carlos, and so on. So I'm going to copy this over here. and remove the extra characters. All right, so let's test this out. So click on my account, copy the username, copy the password, hit login, and here we go. It says, congratulations, you've solved the exercise. All right, so now that we've successfully solved the exercise, let's try and script it. So we'll save this one first, and then we'll go to our script. So the first thing we do is we import the request library, and then the sys library, and URL lib3. We also add this line over here in order to disable any insecure request warnings. So dot exceptions dot insecure request warning. And then we set our proxy setting so that anything, any request that is sent in the script gets sent to but first. This way it allows us to debug our script in case anything goes wrong. All right, so that's 127.0.0.1 and 8080. All right. Next, let's write the main method. So if name is equal to main, and then we'll use our try and accept clause. All right, so the way I want to run my script is I want to give it one command line argument, which is the URL, and then I hit enter and then what it does is I'm going to assume that I already know the number of columns and the data types of the columns. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to script. Instead, in my script, I'm just going to do steps number three, four, and five. And so first we're going to output the list of tables, extract the table that contains the user string, and then we're going to use that table in order to output the column names and then extract the column names that contain username and password. And then we're going to use the table name and the column names in order to output the administrator's credentials. So over here, I'm going to create a variable URL. And I'm going to take it from the command line. So argv1 dot strip. All right. And if I don't give it the correct number of arguments, I don't want it to print an error message. Instead, I want it to print a message that explains the usage and example instructions. So the usage instructions would be the name of the program and then a URL. OK, 
Okay, and then example instructions. And so over here, www.example.com. So this really helps when you haven't run the program for a while and it gives you instructions on how to run it instead of having to read the code. All right, and then I wanted to exit the program because I ran it incorrectly. Okay, so assuming I ran the program correctly, I wanted to print looking for the users table. And then I'm going to create a variable called users table. And I'm going to set it to the return value of the function SQLI users table, and it takes in the URL. So this is a function that I'm going to write in a bit. And then if the users table is empty, is not empty, I want it to print found the users table name and then the name of the table based on the output of the function so based on users table variable otherwise if the users table is empty or returns false then i wanted to print did not find a users table all right so let's write this function over here. So we'll do it in this section. Okay, so it's def SQLI users table URL. First, we set the SQL payload. And that's equal to this one over here. So the payload that outputs the list of tables in the database. Next, I want to make the request with my SQL payload. However, instead of doing it in this function, I'm going to write it in a new function. And the reason behind that is because we're going to be making at least three requests. So one for this one, one for this one, and one for this one. And I don't want to repeat the code in every function. So instead, I'm going to write it in its own function called perform request. And it takes in the URL and the SQL payload. And then I'm going to set the path over here to be equal to the path of the vulnerable function, which we'll get from here. And then I'm going to make my requests using the requests library. And it's a get method as seen over here. So it takes in the path, takes in the URL, the path, and then the SQL payload. I'm going to set verify to be equal to false because I don't want to verify certificates and then proxies to be equal to proxy so that it uses my proxy setting so that it sends the request through burp first just in case I need to debug it and then I want it to return the response which is r.text okay so back to my function for finding the names of the tables in the database. I'm going to call the function perform request, give it the URL and the SQL payload, and then set the response to res. So it's going to make this request for me and save the response in res. Next, I want to extract the name of the user's table from the response. So I'm going to use beautiful soup which is a library that I haven't imported yet. So let's do that right now. So from BS4, import beautiful soup. And we also need to import the regex library. So soup is equal to beautiful soup. And then res, 
and HTML dot parser. All right, so to do that, let's go back to Burp and go back a few requests. All right, over here, so in order to output the users table, we looked at tables that contain the string users. In this case, we actually have multiple entries that contain users, so we need to refine our search a little bit more by checking for tables that contain the string users, and then automatically right after that, you get an underscore. So to do that, we're going to use the regular expression library. So users table is equal to soup.find text is equal to re dot compile so you're using a regular expression and then we're saying it starts with users and then match on the underscore and then any number of characters so extract this string over here all right and then i'm going to return the users table and let's save that and run it and see if we get any errors. So terminal, new terminal. And we're in lab number 10. So let's clear that. And then it's Python 3, SQLI, lab 10.py. And then we need the URL over here, which might have timed out. So let's try. Okay, so let's copy the URL. Paste it. And hit run. And we don't get any errors. Perfect. So it looks for the user stable and then it extracts it. So we've successfully completed step number three. Next, we have to do step number four. All right, so let's make that smaller and go back to our main method. So once it finds the user's table, I want it to look for the username column and the password column. And the way it's going to do that is using a function that I'm going to write in a bit. So it's going to be called SQLI users columns. And it takes in the URL and the users table. And if the username column and the password column are not empty, then I want it to print found the username column name and print the name of the column. So that would be saved in the variable username column. And then I also wanted to print found the password column name. And again, print the column name that contains the passwords. And that's saved in the variable password column. Now, if either one of them is empty, then I wanted to print did not find the username and or the password columns. All right. Now we need to write this function over here. To do that, we'll add a new function. So SQLI, and it's called users columns. Again, it takes in the URL and the users table. First thing we're going to set is SQL payload, and that's going to be equal to this one over here. So output the column names of the users table. But in this case, we don't actually know the name of the users table. So I'm just going to remove that. and add it as a variable and take it from this variable over here. So users table. And this is something that we determine in this function. All right, next, 
I'm going to make the request using the perform requests function. So perform request and it takes in the URL and the SQL payload. I also want to extract the username and password from the response. So we're going to do exactly that. I'm just going to copy it. So we use the beautiful soup library in order to parse the response. And then from there, I'm going to create a variable called username column. And from there, I want to extract the regex string, which is any number of characters and then the string username and then also any number of characters. So if we go back to burp and we see over here, username was labeled as username and then underscore and a random string and then same goes with password. So password, underscore, and then a random number of uh, strings. So that's how we're extracting it. We'll do that for the password column as well. And we extract on the string password. All right, and then we want to return the username column and the password column. Okay, so let's save that. That should have completed step number four over here, but let's see if we've got any errors. So let's clear this and run it one more time. No errors so far, so that's good. Okay, perfect, no errors. So it outputs the user's table and then it outputs the name of the column that contains the usernames and then the name of the column that contains the passwords. All right, so we're left with one more step, which is to output the list of usernames and passwords. And to do that, we go back to our main method. When it finds the username column and the password column, I want it to find the admin password. So I'm going to create a new function called SQLI administrator crud and it's going to take in the URL, the user's table, the username column, and the password column. Okay, and then I'm going to say if admin password is not empty, then print the administrator password is and then whatever is in that variable so the admin password variable otherwise if it's empty i want it to print did not find the administrator password Okay, so now let's implement this function over here. To do that, let's define a new function. And it was called SQLI Administrator Cred. It took in the URL, the users table, the username column, and the password column. All right, so again, it does exactly the same thing that these functions do. So I'm just going to copy this and put it over here. So the SQL payload was this one over here. So copy that and put it in here. So this was a variable that we figure out in our first function, and then this Actually, this is the variable that we figure out in the second function, which is this one over here. Same goes with this variable. And then the user stable is we figure out from the third function. Okay, so let's add that over here. So username column, password column, and users table. 
All right, next we use the perform request function in order to make the request with the SQL payload and save the response in res. And then we use the beautiful soup library in order to parse the response. Now, this is not going to work because now we're looking for the user's password. And in order to do that, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use text.find or actually text. We're going to use text is equal to administrator and then dot parent and i'll explain that in a second dot find next and i know to do this because we've done this in the previous exercises and then dot contents zero all right so let's explain this so if we go over here so the request that outputs the administrator's password and we do administrator so i'm trying to extract the string over here and what i do is i'm saying uh, find the text administrator which is this one over here go to the parent element and then find the next td element which is over here and extract the first string from there which is this one over here okay and so it saves it in the user's table which is incorrect i wanted to save it in a variable called admin password and then i wanted to return the admin password Okay, let's save that and run it one more time to see if it works. Hopefully it hasn't timed out yet. Okay, we get an error on line 57 and it says not all arguments converted during string formatting. So it tells me that this is not string, which is weird it should have been a string unless it didn't find it so i must have done something wrong over here so we say soup dot find and the text was equal to administrator dot parent dot find next td dot content zero and then we're returning admin password so what i'm gonna do is i'm just going to print admin password over here so that i'm able to debug it Okay, so it does find it, but it's still telling me that it's not of type string, which is weird. So let's go back. Oh, and I see what I did wrong over here. I forgot to add the variable, and that's why we were getting the error. All right, so it should have been this over here. So we no longer should get the error. Okay, so it's outputting it over here because I added the print function to debug it. So let's remove that and run it one more time so that the output looks clean. And if we go to proxy, we should see it making the requests. Okay. So it's taking a bit of time. So it says looking for the user's table and then it performs this request over here and it extracts the table. So let's do users. It extracts the string over here and displays it. Next, it performs this request over here using the users table that we just found. And then it extracts the username and password columns, which are over here. And then it uses the username and password columns in the user's table in order to perform this request over here. And then from there, it extracts the administrator password, which is this one over here. So we could use that in order to log in to make sure that we've properly extracted it. And it's a bit slow today for some reason. Let's confirm that burp is off. And it is. So let's go back. All right. So administrator and then the password that the script output it and hit login and that should log us in so if we go back to our code we could see that was 64 lines of code just to exploit one sql injection which makes you appreciate tools like sql map which are much much smarter than this code is um, and they do it automatically for different types of databases and i believe sql map is written in python as well okay so i think we've successfully logged in 
Here we go. So it says, congratulations, you've solved the lab. So we successfully completed the exercise. To recap, in this video, we first manually ran a SQL injection union attack that allowed us to list the database content on an Oracle database. We then scripted the exploit so that it automatically does that for us. So far, we've only been focusing on how to exploit union-based SQL injections. So in the next lab, we'll start learning how to exploit blind-based SQL injection vulnerabilities. If you liked the video, hit the subscribe and share button so that it reaches a wider audience. Also comment below what you learned and what you would like to see more of in the future. Thank you and see you in the next video.